Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Gary on Lockdown. I hope you are feeling a little less locked down these days. But even as one risk diminishes, others haven't gone anywhere. Some threats have grown while we were busy elsewhere, a typical threat pattern. And don't forget that everything is interconnected. Let me make a simple chess analogy. It's not enough to see the threats and changes in the position. You have to understand how they all affect each other. And even if we want to specialize in one area, we cannot ignore how it's linked to others, sometimes in very surprising ways. For example, when it became clear two years ago that we were facing a global pandemic, which areas of digital rights and cybersecurity could you imagine becoming more critical? Some were relatively obvious, such as working and studying from home, and how that created a billion new points of attack outside of corporate firewalls. Others have been more complicated, with geopolitical elements influencing threats against suddenly overtaxed healthcare infrastructure. Ransomware attacks might not seem very relevant to you personally until one shuts down your local hospital hardware. U.S. President Joe Biden recently warned in a press conference that the threat of cyber attacks related to Russia's attacks on Ukraine would impact on Americans. And then we have the rise of attention uh, on cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, and on NFTs including my own, I admit. This had been tied to people staying at home with more disposable income and eager to explore new things, including new tech. So are cryptocurrencies just a fad, a speculation boom soon to be forgotten or to exist only um, on the margins? Are they a powerful tool for convenience and independence from central banks, bringing freedom and efficiency to an, an ancient monetary system? Or are they a threat, a weapon abused by bad actors uh, and criminals to hide in the shadows? As in almost always the case in the real world of new technology, the answer to all these questions is yes. There is a bubble aspect, yes. There are great benefits. Yes, there are also dangers, which, as usual, with powerful new tools, are greater in the early days before systems and regulations can catch up. The old conventional wisdom is that people become more risk averse during a crisis. We want to go back to the way things were before, to press undo and rewind until we feel comfortable again. But that has always been a myth. There is no going back. No matter what happens with the crisis and the virus, the world has changed forever, for worse, and in some cases for better. My guest on lockdown today knows more than just about anyone about these better and worse scenarios, as her job is to analyze and respond to them. I've asked CISO, Chief Information Security Officer, Jay Ballou is joining me to talk about why it's not enough for companies to just throw tons of money at cybersecurity. They have to see the big picture. I'm also interested in how that translates to most of us who are not CISOs or CEOs, not presidents or prime ministers, but who want to make intelligent individual decisions about our security and privacy. A lockdown welcome to you. Oh, thank you so much, Gary. It's such a pleasure to meet you. Let's start with uh, what I was just discussing about how everything is connected. The pandemic has amplified various cybersecurity threats, but I also like to hear some good news. We need yeah. good news these days, uh, if there are any, of course. How has the landscape changed for companies and individuals? And what positive developments can you tell us about? So I think the best thing is the fact that, you know, it's done this huge acceleration in terms of digital transformation. Uh, 
So companies have been forced to change. And there's a good joke, like who's had more impact on your ability to have agility and work from home and work from anywhere? You know, was it your CIO or was it COVID-19? And everybody knows it's COVID-19. So I think we shouldn't negate uh, some of the more positive impulses and the fact that not only are we getting uh, as a society more online and more capable online, uh, we're actually extending um, the realm of innovation and what that means in terms of being able to touch people's daily lives with the good sides of internet. So, um, okay, uh, it's fair to say that in, in, in an ideal world, people wouldn't have to think very much about their security and privacy. But every day, there's a new hack. So it's the, a new leak yeah. or risk announced. Yeah. And uh, there's a panic and a backlash, or maybe worse, almost no response at all. So if there is a, such a thing, what is it's appropriate level of paranoia yeah because so we, i like yeah <laughs> sorry yeah, yeah it's, it's for for individuals uh for companies to have and uh, how can we be safe without feeling that we live under siege sort of a permanent never-ending siege yeah. So again, you know, uh, I, I have a sort of professional dystopia uh, because all uh, people who work in information security have to be professionally paranoid. I even have a T-shirt that says that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think the, the point is you don't really want to carry on this level of fear uh, onto everybody else. Uh, they should have a sane, healthy ability to enjoy the, the benefits of technology. Um, but, you know, there is a certain degree of caveat emptor, which I do think we all need to possess, which we somehow let go of. Um, and that's probably because in cybersecurity, more specifically than any other thing, we have created a market for lemons. And there's this famous paper, I think in the 70s, that was written by an economist whose name always so escapes me at the moment, where he basically said, you know, we are having huge degree of information asymmetry between the buyer and the seller of goods. And this particular phenomenon where uh, the buyer uh, wants to just get something at a reasonable price, but is not necessarily clued enough about what are all the pitfalls and the dangers, et cetera, especially around technology. And the seller does know. And the seller realizes that if he holds on to very high price goods, they may not get sold. But you know, if he could uh, sell a crappy thing for an average price, it probably will. So this information asymmetry between what's good and bad between the buyer and the seller actually encourages poor security decisions to be made because then the buyer is buying not on the basis of am i buying the more secure product uh but am i getting you know the cheapest price or am i going after a certain brand these types of decisions have led us slowly but surely from the 1970s up until now to create the ecosystem of insecurity that we currently live in and whether that's because of insecure protocols uh whether that's because of dependency on very specific security libraries and open source libraries that clungle together make up our modern infrastructure, or the fact that we're buying in, in plethora a lot of IoT devices that are inherently insecure on the basis of price alone, all of this different information asymmetry has led to the problem that we have now, which is that you know cool things actually like cryptocurrency or a secondary financial market, which is there to you know, help the unbanked get banked uh, or to do money transfers for people who would never be given credit or an account if they're working in a foreign country to send money back home. Crypto plays a vital role in this type of economy that needs to happen for a large portion of the world that doesn't have a credit score. So I find it serves a very useful, almost humanitarian purpose in that regard. But because of all of these things that we haven't resolved in this shaky ecosystem, we've made it possible for the downsides to trump the potential upsides. Um, yeah, you talked about uh, a paper from the 70s, half a century ago. I mean, that sounds <laughs> to me like just, you know, like we're talking about the Trojan War now. <laughs> it's just, it's, because in the world of this modern tech, you know, every, every five minutes matters. So this is 50 years. So the risk then, you know, of this asymmetrical um, approach, you know, the sellers and buyers, okay, was 
relevant but uh, not uh, not life threatening okay it's uh, you may not have the best coffee machine i'm not sure there were coffee machines in the 70s yeah. <laughs> it's okay. i'm not so sure it did the drip yeah. engine, remember yeah yeah so this is yeah this. whatever this is it's 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 a washing machine so it's a dishwashing machine but today we're talking about a risk that is just it's immense it's, yeah. just, it's it's the your information can be stolen because you know you wanted this iot device that you know it's 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 um, sold by 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 a big brand name that has a big experience in doing coffee or dishwashing or uh, freezers for 100 years and uh, almost no experience uh, in in uh, uh, cybersecurity so uh, you know it seems to me that after just so many years working with the vast and attending these conferences that you know, no matter how much we are warning people, it's still just, you know, somehow they're not heeding the warnings. So no, it's just, it's, it's, they keep doing the same things as if, you know, it's, this is this not so much at stake. Yeah, but again, I feel it's unfair to only burden shift to the buyer, to the person that should be with caveat emptor to these products, because really, th this is my point, there's also a seller's responsibility here or a maker's responsibility. And you said the 70s was like a generation Trojan War. I agree with you. But... Gary, if we peel back the onion of the current protocol stack that we run our internet on, our mobile telecommunications and our, and our regular internet communications are based on protocols that connect networks to each other. For the internet, that's the BGP, that's the Border Gateway Protocol, where you take one network and you hook it to another network uh, on the internet. That protocol is from the 70s. SS7, uh, the secure signaling layer, which is the foundation of all telecommunication services, is from 1976. So, you know, we are talking about ancient, if we go to the Trojan War, ancient protocols, which are holding up YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, you know, name it. So that's what we're depending on. And we suddenly think that despite that decrepit layer, that foundation, that we can build all this modern technology stacks on top of it. And it's not just those modern technology stacks that we're building today. It's the fact that they're using libraries. So I don't know if you heard about the Log4j incident mm -hmm. uh, that happened this Christmas. A lot of people who are in my profession did not have a great Christmas New Year's because we found a vulnerability in a very widely used open source library, um, which is used by a lot of Java applications. And there was a huge vulnerability there that was also easy uh, to utilize, to compromise an attacker who did, or a target who did not patch. And uh, we were busy this whole Christmas and New Year's fixing this. Um, and it wasn't easy because the people who make all these products, they don't even know that they're using this library in the first place of the roughly 50% of, of things that we would need to get a patch from, from a vendor, the vendor doesn't have a patch available. So up until today, we're vulnerable for those kinds of things all across the internet. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's very interesting because I, I, I knew about the work that's been done in the 60s. That's where the concept of internet was invented. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, doctoral thesis of Professor Leon Kleinrock about packet switching back mm -hmm. in 1962. In 1963, uh, uh, Joseph Licklider, one of the leading uh, scientists in DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, he wrote a paper uh, uh, with, uh, with his team called Intergalactic Computer Network. And he basically described all the components of, of, of the future internet, Skype included, voice over IP. Cool. Uh, and in 1969, the first signal was sent from uh, UCLA. It's a lab led by Professor Kleinrock to, to Stanford, so on October 29th. So I, I was honored actually to do a keynote speech um, 50 years later when they celebrated this, this great event. But I was not aware that, you know, this is this, the protocols, they were so ancient because, oh, this is the, 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 the origin goes back to the 60s. But the fact is that we are relying on the security uh, from, you know, from, from the years of the Cold War, you know, from Brezhnev's era. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow, yes. that's, yeah. that's this, yeah, and uh, wow, that's the, and, and, and we are basically, you know, on this, ancient foundation we're trying to build the this is the it's it's skyscra skyscrapers yes yes absolutely and yeah. and and to just give you an example uh, there is a um, i'm doing a talk at the mobile world congress on 5g security but the biggest issue to 5g security is not some of the newer things that we're building but you know the interdependency of all of these different stacks from cloud and uh, the regular telecom and that 
SS7 layer, there's still a whole bunch of attacks just there in that foundation. So trying to build something on top doesn't help if you have these uh, lower level problems. So uh, uh, it seems to me that, you know, we are giving more bad news to, 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 to our audience. So, so okay, um, uh, any good news? Any, well, just, just give, give, us, give us some hope, you know, that says yeah. we are not, you know, we're not doomed. No, I mean, look, there's a lot of people with a lot of passion and a lot of energy trying to fix this. I think that's the best news. And you mentioned Biden. He's uh, doing a lot now for uh, solving some of this interdependency issue, because a lot of the problem is because it's um, buried in a certain degree of obscurity. Vendors don't know what they have in their product. So what we're trying to do now is that onion that is so hidden is trying to unpeel it. And one of the things that Biden has pushed is this idea of a software bill of materials so that you have basically an ingredients list from every single piece of software, because we don't know. And we should have, I mean, the same capability on hardware. That's already hard enough because we make all our hardware in China and uh, Anyway, that, that's a complexity in and of itself uh, to understand that, but software is global. We're all using the same things everywhere. So there's a vulnerability in one place, it affects us all. So having a, something that's able to like kind of peel the packaging and then understand what the subcomponents are is super important uh, for this entire ecosystem. And the other thing that I think we really need to address is the long tail of vulnerabilities that we have. That's something else that's a very strong program in the in the US specifically, but also across Europe with ANISA. Um, and um, really examine things like new uh, security by design principles that are not so new, but are, you know, from a vendor perspective, very new, which is zero trust networks. So the White House announced that they also want to do that. This is something that we are also trying to do across uh, Europe, uh, but with different vehicles like the Network and Information Security Directive and consumer product uh, improvements as well. So all of these things together, that makes me hopeful for the future, but we're not there yet. Um, and in that time, it's um, dovere non povere. I'm killing the pronunciation, but that was what between Reagan and Gorbachev, um, you know, trust but verify. You said you were not, were not there yet. So uh, are you talking about uh, cybersecurity experts, companies like Avast, or about regulators? Or both? Both. Or both. both. Yeah, because, you know, I was under the impression that GDPR, you know, with all the publicity surrounding this document, addressed very narrow issues. So they, they, this, you, you talked about the vendors. So and uh, I'm, I'm still waiting for for regulators to actually to put some not uh, responsibility on 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 the, on the vendors, on the manufacturers, because it seems to me that, you know, they um, um, uh, they they basically have no responsibility before uh, um, uh, customers uh, for uh, um, insufficiency of their products. Yes, yeah. yeah. But there's so much to unpack just there. Like what is a vendor's responsibility? Uh, to what extent should we have a sort of right to tinker or improve products? Should you be able to fix your car if your car is just a giant computer? Uh, would that mean that you'd be uh, taking away any intellectual property from the vendor? Um, how long does a vendor, if they give you something like your phone, how long are they mandated to support it? If you don't feel like buying a new phone every four years, should the vendor still support updates of software and firmware to that device? You know, how long would you want to keep your phone? And it's one thing when it's your phone, but Gary, what if we buy a smart refrigerator, like you mentioned, yeah. or a washing machine? How often do we replace those things? Well, you know, once every 10 years, you don't want vulnerabilities that are existent on there to still exist because of that long tail, but you also want vendor support for all of that to make sure there's consistent patching and support. But, but that's something that I think the, the companies like Avast, you know, could could initiate. I think it's this very important to lobby the regulators because, you know, I mean, from my experience, you know, talking to, to people who are in charge of these regulations or writing these regulations and, and watching, you know, them, you know, uh, 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 hearing testimonies of the of the captains of big tech uh, i'm i'm not confident that they they do understand what they're doing and what they have to do so it's the, so we i think we need just to educate them and, and and to push them in the right direction it's it's as you say it's we're not yet there 
it, but the, the question is not that we, we, we haven't reached a destination. Are we walking in the right direction? That's a question to me. I, I think, again, this is the reason that I'm so hopeful. I think we are. I do think we could be doing more. Um, you know, one of the things that I really uh, think that we should be doing more of, for example, is right now there's a lot of detractors and we make it possible for them to exist and to do the detraction. I would like to see more privacy and anonymity provided um, and while keeping our cryptography strong rather than looking for ways to break our crypto. That being said, the biggest reasons that are given by law enforcement to put our cryptography in danger is because they're trying to go after a few bad actors, these hard targets. Um, and I really believe that like, we need to find ways to collaborate with law enforcement to get those hard targets, make sure that the places that we know about, for example, DDoS actors or cyber criminals that we know are operating out there or people who we can trace based on cryptocurrency that's moving a particular direction, that we find them and we take them down. Because if we can do that as a community and we can help solve that problem, then we don't need to give up what I believe is almost a fundamental right to privacy and security and anonymity, which is basically guaranteed by some of the cryptographic messages we have across the internet today. Okay, you said this magic word, cryptocurrency. That's the, that's the biggest buzzword these days. And, and I think a lot of people still tune out when they hear about crypto. It's a cryptic word, and the coins are often confused with the blockchain tech itself. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've seen how cryptocurrencies can provide security and liberty to groups who could not operate safely in authoritarian regimes. But mm -hmm. there is also a dark side. Again, yes, it's, it's, it's yeah. a balance. So yeah. the bad, bad guys, you know, they uh, they often find uh, these transactions as a, as a gold mine. So what are your thoughts here and how can we deal with uh, the negatives while preserving and expanding the positives? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, hackers will go where there's something to be gained. Uh, it's just a very simple phenomenon. So um, right now, when you look at the cybercrime market, it's the pretty much the largest, most lucrative place to be if you're any kind of criminal. So there's more money in the cybercrime market than the entire international drug trade. So why be a drug dealer? You know, it's so complex to move all this physical stuff around and you have to deal with your channels and markets. Meanwhile, you can actually net more. And I think there's no greater poster child for this phenomenon of which crime does pay. Uh, well, it's ransomware. And the person who's probably made the most money from it, um, surprisingly, is someone like Kim Jong-un, who, according to a UN report, netted anywhere between two to three billion dollars on ransomware. And I think last year alone, he made something like 500 million. So this is an insane amount of money to be and to think that North Korea with a single internet connection is still managing to get enough uh, threat actor space to be able to deploy these attacks successfully is, is a sort of mind bending thing in and of itself. Um, and that's where we see like cryptocurrency very often as a detractor because how else are you gonna move that money around? Um, and, you know, we also see attackers because ransomware now is not something that's only for sophisticated attackers because it's being provided as a service. You Google it, you can find stuff on the dark web, you, you hook up for a service and then you deploy the tool to all of your victims. So when it's being done like that, you don't need to be this sublime super hacker. You can just be anyone who knows how to use Google and a credit card. Um, and the same thing is true uh, for when you see attacks now, also like on things like crypto miners. Um, so if people are, are doing miners, you know, we see that there is a natural interest in being targeted. Um, and we see that in very specific geographies. At Adavas, we had a very um, uh, specific attack where we saw in Russia and Ukraine a target uh, just for doing these mining operations. And uh, we have a blog about it. And it's, it's around one very specific operation called Coin uh, Helper. So I think you'll find examples that are pretty pervasive and prevalent um, for crypto miners, ransomware. And then there's also like people who are just trying to uh, attack those people that are using cryptocurrency and trying to steal their wallet addresses. Okay. Uh, now, just to finish, you know, with a big on a big note. So um, let's fantasize about the future. Do you believe in the future of crypto, cryptocurrencies? 
So, um, yes, I do, because I do think that there will always, it, it's like saying, can we uh, see a future without the potential to barter? Uh, do we see, because the, there are things that I think once discovered, the genie's never going to go back into the bottle. Yes. Uh, we will always have a barter economy. There will always be people that'll say, I'll babysit uh, for free if you will paint my roof. You know, so the, the, there will, oh, well, I don't know that anyone has roofs painted. That was a poor example, but you know. <laughs> Again, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know what I mean. I think I think crypto uh, currency is here to stay only because it works. It provides a uh, solution to a problem that's existed for decades for people who do not have access to banks. I genuinely believed I was working in the mobile telecommunications industry for a very long time. I thought that. Um, prepaid top up transfer, like when you have a prepaid top up amount yeah. and you put it in your phone and then you transfer it, that that was going to be the future. Because how else can people move money to each other if they can't have a, a, a credit card or a bank account? Because the bank says, well, sorry, I don't I will never give you a bank account because I cannot trust you. Uh, so I think that this is really a solution. So that solution is not going anywhere as long as this economic situation exists. Um, of these, of this entire, you know, group of people. So no, I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's a future. It's just, it's, it could be painful, but I, I, I think at one day, you know, we'll see the, the, the basket of, of, of crypto to replace dollars as a reserve currency. So people say, I'm just, you know, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a wild fantasy. But I think we, we are, we are, you know, heading uh, to this destination. So and. And uh, yeah, it's it's about you know ancient monetary system and about as you said yeah. you know millions no no billions of people now billions of people that have no other access to to monetary system to 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 uh, uh, financial financial instruments. So that means uh, Avast will never be will never be out of business. <laughs> More, more, more tra digital transactions means, you know, more, more uh, uh, bad actors trying to capitalize on it, you know, to steal. So the cybersecurity products uh, will only grow in price. Okay, well, well, optimistic yeah. note. So just your final word. No, I, I really hope that it's not uh, only going to go in price. I hope that what grows in the future is a common sense of security and privacy that we all deserve. And I hope that we are able also in the future to provide that for free with the same quality so that you don't have to worry if you can pay or afford security and privacy because it's a right for all of us. Jay Balu, thank you very much. So that's the end. Uh, you know, I hope this conversation lifted the spirit of our audience. So they will they will see that the benefits will eventually outweigh the, the negatives uh, of uh, technological progress. Thank you. And uh, see you next time on Gary and Lockdown.